Okay, so uh, let's begin. Um, welcome everybody in the audience and uh, in the virtual audience. I hope you can also hear me. Uh, so we have a hybrid event. Um, my name is Mark Veliste. I'm from the Institute of Politics Studies, which is a non-profit think tank uh, in Tartu. Uh, we're wrong, there is an analyst. But we often work with uh, both national and European level projects. And this project is uh, basically uh, from this uh, AMIF program, which is the um, Asylum and Migration and Integration Foundation uh, of the European uh, Union and uh, with the Ministry of Interior. So together with, the, with them, um, we have this project. And the aim of the project is basically uh, to help uh, third country nationals, uh, so non-EU students, to find better opportunities and how to enter the Estonian labor market. Um, and the project has two sort of main activity lines. One is that we have training events, which are like these four-hour uh, training sessions um, that teach, tell you a bit about the Estonian working culture, how to apply, what to keep in mind, where to find information about employment opportunities, uh, and so on. And some of you might have already attended uh, last year, but we will be continuing with these activities in the fall season as well. And the information we distribute to universities emailing lists. Um, and later at the end of the day, I also have a direct link um, to one of these sessions. So if you have not attended, you're also welcome to join one of these um, training sessions. And in parallel, then we have these events where we bring together students and employers uh, and nonprofits and social enterprises. Um, and then this is a chance to sort of meet face to face, and uh, the companies can then. Uh, share their knowledge about, or you know, if, if they have open positions, they will tell what they're looking for at the moment, and they also give usually some advice about what to keep in mind when you would apply and how does the application process begin um, proceed. And then today we also have three companies with us who will tell about what their company does and also uh, how and if they're, they've recruited students in the past or at the moment. Um, and of course, you know, this is the title of today's event, Working on Social Enterprise in Estonia. So it, today we have also a special focus on social entrepreneurship. This term might be new to some of you, uh, so hopefully it will become also clearer uh, throughout the session. But in principle, um, social enterprises uh, are those that do not have the profit as their main aim, but they have the social good. Uh, they might still earn profits, uh, but then these profits are reinvested for the same social good. Um, so it's a bit of a different business model, but they're not also necessarily charity organizations. Um, so they produce something, they sell something to generate revenue, but then they either employ people, uh, let's say people, people with uh, special needs or some other uh, characteristics that are find it hard to get employment uh, in the regular working market so that they employ these people and give them a job opportunity, or they also reinvest the profits that they make through these sales. Uh, another characteristic usually with social enterprises is that they have democratic governance models uh, as well. So they're, they're less hierarchical maybe than a regular business would be. Um, yes, but then uh, just a few rules for the day as well. Uh, so uh, basically after each presentation, you have a chance to ask questions. Uh, so in this auditorium, please raise your hand and then uh, I will moderate the discussion and, and take your question. Um, we also have participants online, so in this case, uh, the people who are with us online, please write your question, questions to the Zoom chat. And my colleague, uh, who's also with us, Robert, uh, will then be taking those questions when the time comes. So I will ask Robert whether we have, and yeah, Robert is, um, he's on the screen, on my screen, but not on this screen, but uh, we'll, we'll see you later, Robert. Um, and this way we'll try to manage this hybrid event, um, because so far all of our events have been virtual, Today is the first chance we have uh, to meet in person. Um, and I guess the second rule always is let's be polite and, and friendly to each other um, in this session. Um, the agenda. So as I mentioned, uh, after me, I will give word to Patrice from Tallinn University to say a few words about uh, their MA program on social entrepreneurship. And then we have our three companies. So we have Citizen OS with Annette and uh, Sarah with us here. Uh, then we have EAO with Ep and Marilis in the back. And then, of course, from, from you, we have Klaus Kenneth as well. Um, the only change in the agenda is that uh, we unfortunately are not able to show this video from the Social Entrepreneurship Network, but this we will add uh, later on to the recording that we will share with you. Uh, so no, no harm done. 
Um, and after the session, uh, once all the formalities are, have ended, um, you do have a chance to approach uh, our speakers if you have a question you want to ask uh, in private, or maybe you didn't have a chance uh, because I didn't give you the time or the work. Um, and this this uh, is already it for now. So, Patrice, you can join me um, on stage. And, uh, Thank you. Hello, I'm Katri Sletik, and I'm currently the coordinator of the Social Entrepreneurship Masters Program. And we are also going to pilot a social enterprise incubator, actually together with Mart, uh, in the framework of one uh, new funded project starting this autumn. So just very briefly about the Social Entrepreneurship Masters Program. So we um, are actually doing it in the form of a project-based learning which we think is still a little different than the rest of the master's programs at this university. So we are encouraging the students to come up with their own uh, projects or their own eventually, hopefully, social enterprises. So Mark already captured the two years program in, in short instantly what it's all about, what the social enterprises mean and, and how we also define them here. So we are indeed encouraging all the students to solve some societal or environmental issues with their projects. And obviously the labor market is indeed a very complex one. It's, it's hard to, to access it. But of course, we also think in terms of like, let's try to learn from the expertise and also from the failures and success of the other enterprises. So therefore, we give you the chance to, to meet with uh, the existing entrepreneurs and go out there and, and do your internship so that to see how things work in practice or don't work in practice. So our uh, internship is aimed at being about uh, 150 hours long, so that's about a month. And uh, well, students can actually do it throughout the whole year at some point. I mean, Practically in the curriculum, it's in the third semester, but basically they are encouraged to do it anytime that it fits within their agendas and, and the curriculum. So, so that's really shortly about how that works. And, and today's event is also in order to try to match a little bit the, the students and, and the companies. So, yeah, I'm really happy to have you here. Thank you. But at least before you sit down, and I also I should mention that Patrick is one of our most prominent experts on social entrepreneurship uh, in Estonia, and you also have long experience in the UK working with an actual social enterprise there. Um, so maybe just a personal question to you, uh, why do you like being a social entrepreneur? Um, well, that would be a pretty long story maybe, but try to capture it short. I've been, uh, um, that might have a little bit negative connotation as well, because I've been involved in, in uh, consulting and writing EU-funded projects for about 20 years now. So, uh, and when we started, so uh, it was so much I saw in those projects that actually the target groups that um, the projects were focusing on or were aimed at never really got the money. I mean, they, they got a little bit of it, but a lot of the money actually went for the administration and a lot went to, to really some sort of uh, side events or never really um, helped, in my view, to develop really the, the causes. So that's why I, I really thought that if I get myself involved in helping target groups that I can make a difference myself. So I, I really want to, to get to those that don't in the field and, and see what it's like there. And in the UK, we are dealing with ex offenders and helping them uh, to the labor market. So they work with us and provide environmental maintenance services. So I've, I've been there, seen that, done all the uh, stages myself just in, in that process. So followed, followed our own target group around and I think I know what it takes to, to be in that field. I've seen a lot of those difficulties myself, so I, I think I, I um, practice what I preach. Thank you, uh, but 
Yes, that's the one with our agenda. Um, so I would like to invite our first speakers, uh, Annette and Sarah, on stage. So hello, everybody. My name is Annette Kiko. I'm from Mansions of MS Foundation. And uh, this is my lovely colleague, Sarah Shalikhan, who is the CEO of the Foundation. So uh, I would like to start uh, with the problem that uh, we are tackling in our organization. And uh, the issue that we are tackling is that uh, very often like the most important decisions uh, are being made by very small people. And uh, very often those decisions make it, those decision makers don't even know how uh, their decisions are affecting uh, the people's lives uh, and well-being. And uh, if you think about uh, representative democracy, for example, then this is like a very good example. We elect each, um, after every vote, we elect the people to represent us. Uh, also, the same thing happens in universities, for example. We have like, a small group of people, usually students. Uh, we have a small group of uh, people who represent like, the local community, for example. And uh, this is what we want to change in Zunzi and West. And uh, uh, how uh, we um, are going to do that. So we have uh, developed the platform, digital platform, uh, which is called Citizen OS. And uh, um, the aim of this platform is to bring people and communities together so that uh, there would happen like very well uh, structured, argument-based discussions um, with uh, like uh, very like good information and like uh, and facts and figures and everything uh, which supports like the argument based discussions and also uh, this is a platform where people can uh, and communities can do collaborative decisions so <clears throat> so this is what we do from one side we develop this technology and then from the other side we also uh, kind of share our know-how uh, we share our expertise and our experiences in how to um, hold those argument-based discussions, how to moderate those, because uh, just you know, putting up or like initiating one argument uh, argumentation uh, doesn't uh, yet bring like the collaboration or the change. And uh, so this is what we do uh, in Zeus in the West. And uh, our foundation was uh, established uh, six years ago already by a bunch of um, uh, civic activists from uh, Let's Do It Foundation. Um, and Let's Do It Foundation is organizing, back then it was organizing like one day cleanup events only in Estonia, and uh, today uh, it has grown like into global um, initiative, uh, which is uh, called the World Cleanup Day. And uh, like our organization uh, is uh, pretty much following a uh, civic initiative kind of mindset from one side. And from the other side, as we are developing civic tech, and we have uh, developers and, and uh, uh, technical people working uh, in Citizen OS as well, then we are also following the mindset of uh, kind of startup organizations. And what uh, it means is that uh, Citizen OS is really flat. So we basically don't have any like, uh, hierarchy or structure in our organization. Uh, there are 10 people. Citizen OS and uh, about uh, 20 people volunteering and locally in Estonia, uh, in other countries, in um, India, and in Asia. And uh, what our volunteers and interns do? Uh, so, uh, uh, our volunteers have helped us to uh, translate our platform into 15 different languages. Um, they have uh, help us to develop our, our open source code, uh, some features, for example. But also, uh, they are helping us to do like different projects, like society projects. In Indonesia, for example, we have a youth festival, which is pretty much uh, pretty much organized by the volunteers. Uh, in India, uh, they have a Zinzin Sketch project, which is initi initiated and led by Sala. And uh, just uh, last week in Estonia, we held our first uh, 
and use exchange, uh, which was also the collective gaming and uh, that the delivery of the volunteers. So we love volunteers and we love <laughs> teachers. And, um, and if you talk about the, the expectations or, or uh, what we expect from uh, people to join our team, then there are actually two expectations. The uh, first one is that uh, we expect the people to be because we are, as we are a free flat um, organization, we don't have leaders who provide like, the tasks or say what you need to do. So we expect that the people will get inspired by our mission and they will come to us and say, okay, there is, I have this really cool idea that I want to do it together with you. And, uh, and uh, this is, you know, how we do things. And uh, the other expectation is that uh, people uh, should be uh, with uh, rather high uh, self-management skills. And basically for the same reason. Because we don't want to control people. We don't want to like uh, say what to do and like, do tasks and, and that kind of things. We expect that people manage their own time. People manage their own work. And this is how we work. Teams and uh, we want uh, globally, like uh, global teams. <laughs> Let's say like that. Um, so, um, and how to apply to Citizen OS? So, uh, if you go to Citizen OS platform and uh, scroll down to the careers uh, page. Then uh, you can see here uh, we have uh, volunteer positions and currently we have two open positions. The positions, one is um, uh, Sarah is looking for volunteer uh, communication specialists uh, in uh, uh, who would help uh, her to develop this uh, citizen speech project. Uh, this is one thing. And uh, the other um, volunteer position that we have is um, department or people, we don't have department, uh, are looking for market marketing uh, in turn and uh, help us to make uh, this research. So we are in a place uh, with our organization where we want to improve the experience and uh, that's why we need uh, help. And how you can apply is basically if you go to this uh, website then you will find um, the application button, just uh, <laughs> put this button, <laughs> push the button and, and apply. Uh, you can also write uh, directly to me or uh, to Lina or Sarah. We are going to be here. You can ask more questions uh, from us. And we are happy to provide you more information on in our contact. Yes, please. Uh, we are at HBO, so we, uh, our platform is for free. And so uh, we have uh, private uh, funders who support our organization. So this is how we get uh, funding. And uh, as far as our platform is free, then it doesn't mean that one day it uh, would like uh, take money for, for the users. But for now, we are NGO, we are non-profit, uh, not non-governmental. Yes, but if you have like any other questions, then I will share. Sure, we later. can have questions and we don't sit down yet. Uh, yeah. let, first, <laughs> first, let me see if we can uh, connect with uh, my colleague Robert, uh, because he's uh, moderating the discussion. So, Robert, let's see if we can hear you. Uh, Hello. Hello. Hello can you can you hear me well? Yes. I might no. repeat your questions to the people in the back, but I can yes. hear you. So. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. Great. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm as being responsible for this uh, chat today and the participants online. Uh, yeah, I was also listening to the presentation and it was very interesting to hear uh, your mission and your vision. Uh, but you also talked about uh, the passion and like self-management that are important uh, for like the new applicants that want to actually apply for volunteering positions at your company. Uh, uh, but like what kind of skills do you expect from volunteers to have? Uh, like in terms of communication, in terms of responsibility, and so on. Yeah, I think you heard, and it's a question about skills. Uh, 
but then a very good question. So um, we see that uh, the internships, providing internships and volunteerships opportunity in our organization is like a kind of uh, taking social responsibility. Uh, so um, th that's why we actually don't expect that the young people or, or people who apply for our organization uh, are like highly skilled. So we rather like uh, are looking for the right mindset and we are rather looking for um, being proactive um, and doing the right thing I told you about. And if of course if the, the person wants to join like the marketing team, there should be at least interest in marketing or communications. Um, yes. So so basically you provide uh like you, you teach them at the spot then if they really want to kind of be proficient in marketing and help out with this yes. all right that's great uh, and Robert, we, can, we have time for one more question from your side so. okay well then it's a typical question that i like to ask from everyone uh, what about estonian language is knowing estonian an asset uh, no it's not actually because uh, like uh, as i told when uh, simon started the communication specialist uh, So um, in Estonia we have like uh, people who speak Estonian and uh, like for, for some certain projects yes we need uh, we must be Estonian but as we have also like projects in uh, India and Indonesia and other uh, European and uh, European countries then it's not like uh, necessary English is mm -hmm. all right I think you will be thinking, I'll ask myself from Sarah, because uh, I understand that you're also, you're also studying in Estonia. I, I just graduated. You just got, well, congratulations. Um, so how did you end up working for Citizen OS? Uh, in well, uh, I started out as a volunteer, and uh, ironically, uh, I met Annette and my colleague Nina at a internship fair at uh, Tallinn University. And, uh, of course, uh, public speaking is not really my forte, and speaking in general is something that makes me uncomfortable. So I walked past their booth about a hundred times, thinking, should I ask them a question? Should I ask them a question? And then finally, I summoned up some courage and I said, "Hi, I'm really interested in what you do. I'm interested in civic technology. I previously worked with another civic technology organization, and they said, oh, wow, that's that's really cool.' And then they started telling me a little bit about what they did, and uh, we kind of had a connection. So then I just sent an email saying, "Well, I'm very interested in volunteering, and I'm going to connect with the office, and my volunteership started." And uh, six months later, I think it got converted into put back into working position, which is which I was not expecting to be honest. But yeah, I mean that's that's a very good story because this is something we we encourage as well. That uh, we had another event uh, last December about volunteering in nonprofits in Estonia because we know that it, it is a barrier to sort of as a foreign student to get your foot into the labor market uh, unless you study IT. Uh, uh, but then it gets a bit trickier, and then how to make connections that would be beneficial for you. And actually, one of the recommendations is that if you have the time from your studies to volunteer a few hours for some cause that is dear to you, whether it's working with elderly, uh, you know, working with difficult youths, uh, going to the animal shelter, or some other program, uh, then this can actually open up new avenues later on as well. Either the organization might employ you, as in the case of Sarah, or um, you just meet people through this process and get good local connections that help you also uh, move on from something else. Um, so I also recommend looking up our, uh, that, that video afterwards. Uh, but, but Sarah, last question to you. Uh, you mentioned that there's a project in India and you're also looking for this uh, uh, volunteer for that. Could you say a few more words what this project is about? Uh, so this is a pro which, uh, project is about data accessing uh, in India. Mainly it's about uh, engaging uh, as many people as possible in the debate about data and data ethics, especially people who would not usually be included for uh, various reasons to do geography or socioeconomic background. So currently we form the core team, but what we are missing is a communications manager who specializes in mass media primarily. Uh, I think uh, probably a lot of you are already aware, but uh, uh, India still doesn't have a very good internet penetration rate for the country. So, we need to look at other channels, and this is a complex that I think all of you are acting as. This is primarily what we're looking for. Uh, 
Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes, Patrick, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, did I get it right that you're actually funding by the time to the... Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I presume you actually are in need of like good sales information to get some funds uh, we are working on it in fact yes because uh, like we have basically reached to the level where we have the group that helps we went through the work to get the documents and then now we have been to expand and grow and escalate our program so yes currently we are in the space where we are looking Maybe Robert, uh, anything else come from the audience virtually? One last question. Nope, there are no questions. Well then, thank you both, Annette and Sarah. Uh, and as, I, as we said before, later we can still approach them and ask uh, your follow-up questions. Um, so now uh, I would like to bring Thea uh, Hoog on the stage. We are Ip and my buddies from a foundation called uh, and uh, we are active incubators there and uh, we try to give you a brief uh, uh, resume what we are doing and uh, uh, what the, our foundation is about. So. Uh, uh, foundation, the Momentum is created in, in 2010. Uh, we belong under AES Oleg and the Danish, uh, a welfare service company. Uh, uh, what offers different support for intellectually and mentally ill people. Uh, they come in daily to our work center. Uh, uh, like two or four hours depends on their ability and it's like a service uh, and we can try to help them to go out to real uh, work field and they can see their, what they're able to do and so on. So there are yeah, job opportunities for people with special psychological needs, uh, they're adults um, and they are sent to us from Republic of Estonia Social Insurance Support and uh, Unemployment Insurance Fund. Uh, we have a service uh, where they can develop at their level and, uh, and uh, yes, we try to help them to actually get out work and so we have different services the first is employment support service uh, where over all our centers are one three customers uh, 11 work centers related to the service and uh, it means that the They wish to find a job and we help them and guide them. And this is for like a shorter period. Uh, then we have Pekate, what is long term shelter employment service. First stage is four months for trial, and after they can stay in service in our center as protected um, uh, employment for three years. Uh, we have uh, 48 customers in 13 work centers related to the service. And then we have LKT, what 
a short-term shelter employment service directed from employment insurance fund means that the time for our service is limited or short term and uh, more going out from the center. So there are 39 clients uh, at the moment, six work centers related to the service. And we evaluate their ability to work to see what they're able to do. Uh, and do they have opportunity to go and work actually in a real job? Uh, we have 16 centers at all of Estonia. Uh, in every center, there are activity leaders, and uh, they're doing different creative things. And let's talk about this now. Uh, Keywords for our foundation is reuse, practicality, integrity. Um, yeah. So we're using different uh, things like old t shirts, paper, uh, like old things, what we can remake, reuse, and uh, and then we're actually making things. And we have some things with us that we can show to you. Example, we have sniffing mat. What is it made for dogs? <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, in here, like, so we can find the food or something. And uh, I can just explain how this is made. Uh, this is one uh, plastic thing. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, clients do different things. Some are uh, cutting with scissors, uh, small pieces from t shirt, uh, and then in another place they are uh, nothing them together. So eventually we have a project like this. And uh, this is just one example of what they are doing. Uh, I can show you now more. Um, what work, what kind of more work we do. <laughs> uh, we have things from felt. Uh, uh, this is a uh, sauna hat. <laughs> it's a frog. Uh, and the main point is, is that in, we try, try to do things what are pretty, what are different, uh, what are fun for people who find this, and also like to them to make it. And, uh, and yeah, uh, this is uh, also made of our clients. Uh, then we have things like this. Uh, it's also from the old t shirt. This is for dogs that they can do it. And then we have our rock, what is made uh, from old jeans. And then we have a wooden uh, basket. Uh, and then there depends where they are in the level. Uh, they can, uh, with some paper, uh, scratch it or paint or, yeah, or two different things. And then we have bags, one bag like this. Because some of them get uh, used sewing as well. Uh, they actually, some of them have even been in school. Like they actually have studied something. But uh, because they have psychological problems, then they are not able to go out. So, yeah, this is some examples of what they're doing. Also, uh, we have in like a custom work and subcontracting. Uh, something like new heptic campaign. I don't know, have you heard about this or do you know? But we have like the blue flowers, uh, what are uh, made uh, to recognize veterans of the defense forces and the defense league uh, who have died in the, in the wartime. And then they have put them together and then people can buy them. 
store. Uh, and yeah, and then we also have places where they can do a housekeeping job or like different other things. Uh, yeah, so th there are more examples. And these are these uh, uh, different units that you can uh, We are from Tallinn Center, uh, and there we, um, yeah, <laughs> this is what we have there. Uh, and uh, so many people ask from me very often that isn't your job stressful? And then I have been thinking that how I'm explaining that this is the least stressful job what I ever have done. Because every day uh, when I'm going to work, the clients are very sincere, they're very you know, like loving and uh, they make you smile and also like we can fill their days and they want to come there because they have like friends already there and they like to do this uh, simple and small things and uh, yeah we can fulfill each other uh, yeah. all the job that we're doing in this uh, work center it's mean we do because of, we want to help them to go over labor markets. Sometimes when it's one year, two years, three years, but all the life we have to thinking they will go to out to where we will find them the job to go from open labor market. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ed, and ladies, and maybe, yeah. I can ask you the first question myself. So do you also have students who help you as interns in your service centers? No, in our service centers, no. We haven't had yet, uh, but I think it would be very lucky to have. <laughs> but so. I have my experience in Post when I was in Google, and I had uh, many EBS service volunteers. So, in principle, international students would also come and help you out? Yes. I think this is very international thing because, like, you don't need very much language to like uh, communicate with them. So, language is not a barrier. They will be very happy. <laughs> so, questions from the audience? Does anybody have? And Rob, no, please go ahead. What you said you help people find jobs in different countries. So, do you guys have some proper uh, countries? Maybe you can like just uh, send someone here and they can start their job. Do you just have some centers where you click on the make some technical services? Uh, yeah, we like this is the center where we are and what we're doing there. But we also uh, really help with them. Like uh, we do have some objects or some places where we're going uh, with them, helping them, where they're actually doing like a, some job. And then uh, they can do this trial days and uh, some companies who we are related to, then we send some people and then like they're using this as a service, yeah, that uh, our clients are going and doing the job. Yeah, because one part of our work is to find good like, companies who are able yeah, to go to work to take good like, people. So that we can like we also are responsible of uh, things like if they're not going to work like this is uh we have to you uh, still connected with those person you're sending the company hmm? you still connected with the person you're sending the company yeah uh, like depends who is going like there are different levels like their problems and their 
So if they're like this, then they actually can go and be by their own, then eventually they can solve that. It's how we have to actually help them out. So do you guys have proper skills, like uh, in your center? For example, if a person comes to you and he wants to uh, work in his home or in the company, so do you guys provide some services for skill or do you guys just make some stuff like this? Do you guys help people to get some skills or do you just like make some stuff and send some stuff? Not the like not some special skills, but yeah, we, we try it. A bit of working, working yeah. So these are this some special like, skills because we don't have machines or something like this. But it's yeah, this habit is a very important working uh, well, it's time, it's work time, it's... and we practice this kind of things. And when we do with uh, this company, this open market uh, labor market company, then we start with this client together to. Yeah, and also like what are our job that we're finding out what are their like yeah. where their are their strength, what they can do the best, what are their skills. Yeah, we, we can find it out. So this is like what why they are there like for months or for years. But are you working only with the psychological disabilities or also uh, physical and other yeah. And very often, like, if you look at them, you can actually <laughs> Like, it is. So for some of them, you can't find, like, you can't find out that the are Some of them look like normal people. <laughs> Robert? Uh, Let's take some online questions. I, I see that some have been coming in. Yes, there are three questions asked so far from uh, presenters. Well, the first one could be actually asked, uh, answered because you've already answered it. Uh, one person asked if you have any Estonian language requirements, uh, to which you said no, if I'm correct, right? So the question is, do you have an Estonian language requirement? Do you need Estonian language to enter the work? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you said before that you basically don't need the language skills because you yeah, communicate yeah. differently. Yeah, right? yeah. But of, of course, we, we have to communicate with uh, volunteer or practice, but uh, we speak a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, our clients, maybe some of them. Uh, My practice is like this, yeah. Because, uh, yeah. When you know some of words in Estonia, then you already you start to communicate with them, and then you learn. Yes, one of the rules very quickly. This is also something that uh, we we found out sort of in our previous research is that uh, if you're a foreign student in, in Estonia, if, even if you don't you know speak it at B1 or very fluently, uh, just going through like A1 to A2 course also seems to be a way to sort of get better in, at net networking, uh, whether it's in the non-profit sector in, or in the business sector, it somehow breaks down some barriers of like communication. You, know, you, you become uh, exciting for the Estonian if you know a few uh, you know, the main phrases. Uh, uh, so my, my, of course, recommendation always is that if you're just beginning your studies in Estonia, it doesn't hurt to go through at least one language course. Uh, it, might, it, it might help you out once you, you, you have graduated and you're looking for a job. Uh, but Robert, uh, you, you said you had more questions. I think we have time for one more uh, from your side. Uh, yes, um, well, they're actually connected to each other because uh, one person asked uh, if you if you attract additional finance like uh, donations or you are uh, fully self-sufficient and uh, how much support does the Estonian government provide to your company? So I'll repeat the question again. Uh, so are you also reliant on donations or the Estonian government funding or is it all what you earn uh, by, by selling uh, the merchandise? Uh, those uh, services of Marilis explained is long term uh, and uh, short term services. They, it's government, uh, gives 
money, of this client and this service money. Yeah, but uh, but this is also a, a pretty common, I think, companies, a model for social enterprises to work as well, that some revenue stream will come from the public sector. It's, it's not that common actually in Estonia yet, always, but it is in Sweden, uh, uh, for example, that the public sector plays a big part also in social entrepreneurship. Um, but I understand just because you, you brought these nice items to show to us, I understand on your website you also have an online market. Yes, we do have, I forgot to but we do have online market uh, <laughs> Yeah, and uh, everyone can go and uh, check this. Uh, and Oh, what's this like? uh, yeah, if you're interested. We have to hold the links later uh, in any case. Um, any questions still from the audience, from the physical audience? Thank you, Robert. If not, then let's move on and again, we can approach uh, later. Uh, so thank you. So in Estonia, we also have this network called Social Enterprise Estonia. So it's like a group, this uh, okay. network organization that brings together um, all social enterprises in Estonia, not all of them, but, but some of them. And um, this is your main uh, mission. Um, so they try to promote social entrepreneurship uh, in Estonia. And so what they do in brief is that uh, they were founded in 2012 and they now have around 50, 50 members. And they are also a strategic partner for the ministry. So when the Ministry of Interior is designing its, its policies, towards um, social entrepreneurship, then they also uh, consult with this network uh, to get their input on what would be most useful and most helpful. And it's an interesting process going on at the moment. We're seeing more and more um, things happening regarding social entrepreneurship in general in Estonia, um, because for a long time, we only had the non-profit and, and for-profit private sector, but we were missing sort of this in-between that somebody who would call themselves as a social entrepreneur. Uh, because in Estonia, we don't have a legal uh, legal, uh, there's no legal entity called the social enterprise. You're either a non-profit or a limited liability company, basically, or a foundation. Uh, whereas in some countries, it is a legal uh, term as well. Um, but the, the, the short summary of this is that you can also check out their website, the sev.ee, and uh, they also have now a Slack channel that they invite people to join. So who's ever interested in social entrepreneurship in Estonia, they are growing this virtual Slack network um, as well. Um, and all this information we will have in the slides that will be shared afterwards or in the recording as well. So, so I was the one uh, given the task to tell you why social entrepreneurship is cool and what it is. And I was thinking myself that probably all you can Google so that what part is not so important, but more this kind of why part. Because, you know, stories with people are different. Um, and my backstory is a little bit different than somebody else's. So to some, it might like it, it might click to some, it's not just keep on like open mind. But basically why I love to be a social entrepreneur or why, or why I love to help the sector is that I was this kind of guy with a cheeky smile at school. I like to ask different questions. So I was always this guy who didn't like school because I didn't get too much answers. Why it was like this is that I was the one asking like, why do we do this? Or like, how does this math helps me in the long, long run? Or what, what's the benefit of doing it? Or how do I use it in my, my life or every day? And always, I didn't get so much answers from my teachers. Like from some, I had like good relationships, but with others, by asking those questions, I just got this kind of typical that do it. You need it for a test or do it because it's written in the written in the like law. You have to do this. And that was frustrating because, well, I had questions. But then um, I thought that, OK, well, teachers won't help me. I will ask from my classmates, uh, like, what do we want to do in like five years or, or like what's your what your goals or why are you learning? And with them, it was kind of the same way that they were like, what you're like philosophy, just, just do what's needed and that's all. And that's frustrating when you're in end of your middle school or just going to like high school and already asking those questions, but you don't have anybody to get the answers from or, or discuss it through. And that's how my 12 years of school ended. I went to university. It took me one month to understand why I was going to school in 12, for 12 years, because the lecturers 
and teachers at university, they answered these kind of questions. So in a month, I understood why I've been studying for 12 years, but with 12 years, I didn't get the idea. And that was really like eye-opening. I started asking more questions. I, I got those answers. It like helped to raise my awareness and, and set goals and get, get this kind of perspective. What, what do I want to have? And like, well, what are the questions or answers I'm looking for? And that made me curious. I started the Erasmus Plus uh, traveling. I took part organizing TEDx uh, Tetu. And at one point, um, I saw this kind of advertisement advertisement in my school, Tallinn University of Technology newsletter that said, here is seven reasons to change the world. And that got me really curious. I liked the reasons, I liked the pictures and everything. So I went to do my um, internship in Estonian Social Enterprise Network, where I am at this moment. So that is the thing that got me really to say curious or, or inspired me when I got over there that I got to talk with social entrepreneurs. I got to understand like what are they doing to make the situation better around us. And this is basically what we do in Estonian Social Enterprise Network. That our job is if you just have an idea, it's to make this kind of seed to make it grow, that it will be a high tree and you will be a successful entrepreneur. If you already are, your plant is already raising, our job is to make that you're more successful. See, so in SEV or SN, what we do is that we help this kind of ecosystem that the social enterprises would be as successful as there would be as many of them in Estonia. So we want to have this kind of smiling people and that the environment would be more sustainable because these are the big problems that social enterprises are solving. One great example how social entrepreneurship is super cool is uh, alive and kicking. They are uh, that social enterprise that has most balls, like football balls in Africa. It's not Adidas, it's not Nike, it's alive and kicking. Why it is, is that they have really wicked problem to solve. As you all know, uh, in Africa, there are a lot of health problems. And this is what the live and kicking is uh, tackling. Because what they do is that they have football trainings with those guys and children you see over here. And what they do in this football trainings is, well, they train. On the side of that, they teach uh, like uh, hygiene or like uh, health, basically how different cells are being attacked by viruses and how to protect from that. What those 10, 11, 13 year old kids learn from there is that how to deal with their health a little bit better. They go home and they share that with their parents as well. And this is how um, the health uh, sector is raising or how the awareness about health and viruses is getting in the better situation in Africa. And that's how their social entrepreneurship is working. They have a big problem to tackle, what is lack of awareness about health issues what they do with it is that they uh, teach it through trainings, but their enterprise and business part is selling those boards. So this is kind of a fun example how the social entrepreneurship comes together. And it's very cool because you can solve these kind of wicked problems while doing it in a sustainable way. And probably that's the, this kind of answer for you as well, if you're thinking that this social entrepreneurship is something for you or not. Because there are different people in the world. There are those who want to have prestige, who want to be in this kind of high position, who want to have power and make decisions. There are those people to who it is very important to do something meaningful. I am that kind of person. That you want to have the reasoning behind it and want to have this kind of impact uh, through your life. There are those people who just want to have this kind of stable work that you know every a day that you work from eight to five and that's all you get your amount of salary that you're getting and that's all there are those people who are really on one side as well who don't care about money who just want to you know go through life with a good flow so there are different people and i would say that social enterprises or social entrepreneurship is something that clicks probably pretty well with people who have this kind of meaningful um reasoning coming behind it so if you want to have like this kind of meaningful life but at the same time you like to solve this kind of big problems like for example it's the health issues or it's mental health or it's just uh, like sustainability on the earth then social entrepreneurship might be for you so for some it's definitely something that you should do to some it's definitely not you should shouldn't do it so the answer actually that 
underlies over here is that like what kind of person you would like to be and if you get the answer then you know well why social entrepreneurship might be cool for you or not and is it for you or not so thank you for your time yes but this is this is it uh from self uh now i would like to invite our third speaker from you move uh, so uh, klaus kenneth so welcome to join Welcome to everyone my name is klaus kenneth as mark already told you uh, depends on klaus so to you i'm also klaus uh, I'm from Umoop, I'm CEO of Umoop, so uh, we're a Estonia based company, uh, we've been on the market for over two and a half years, this, this year alone we have tried to focus more on, uh, on, on the foreign side of the world, and right now we have around 60, uh, we have users from 60 different countries and, uh, and over 150 companies. So uh, what we're doing, we're actually trying to solve a lot of different uh, wellness and physical activity problems, because we see that we have those huge companies, but uh, physical culture needs to be, you know, a little bit pushed uh, towards, because right now the remote office, COVID, anything, we are all sitting in our offices and our rooms, uh, you know, not really knowing what to do. And, and that's actually a problem for HR people as well, because, you know, the communication is quite hard. It's really hard to engage the social spectrums and everything. and uh, you know, we have created this tool where basically an HR can create different uh, activity challenges for the people, for different countries, departments, and they can track all of their activity data to different wearables. We all have some, you know, watches, which are, you know, read our steps, but our phones as well, calories and so on. So the basic info. And, uh, and actually we started off as a uh, two or three person company. Uh, right now we are a company of uh, seven people. And uh, the great thing is that we have actually had a lot of people from uh, uh, outside of Estonia as well. For example, our designer is from Russia, from St. Petersburg. So we're having uh, each morning, we're having like those uh, discussions and meetings uh, just to give an overview of uh, how, how we did yesterday and what we're doing today. And uh, actually one of the requirements, uh, so to speak, uh, is, is to be really active on the wellness field. So, you know that you know health is important. You do some kind of sport activity, or you have a hobby. So, uh, in, in that sense, uh, running or doing some kind of uh, sport activity is is our, our way, means so to speak. And just really quickly uh, about our mission. So we have seen that you know it's quite important to uh, give the right communication to people what we're actually wanting them to do, or how can we encourage them. Uh, we saw a lot of companies actually, you know, giving out money saying, oh, here's 20, 50 euros per month, go do some sports. But we thought that this isn't enough, you know, saying people, here's the money, go do something. It's not quite motivating, is it? You know, maybe some developers get, you know, high amounts of money and they don't care for that extra. So we thought that, okay, we should step in here and actually uh, create something, you know, which is really like gamified, engaging, and at the same time, brings people together. And, and right now we have created a platform, we have over like 10 different uh, challenges, uh, what HR can lead and uh, take part with their whole team. So basically company is the, uh, you know, company is paying for it. We are a business to business model. And, uh, and uh, the product itself, uh, unfortunately people cannot just uh, download it and, and start using it because uh, it's paid to use, so to speak. And uh, we, we give out to companies like those special codes so they can start using it. And uh, yeah, we do partnerships with uh, all kinds of different uh, providers such as Polar, Google, Apple, and so on. So to get all the right data to, uh, to, to you. Uh, here's, here's a little picture of uh, one half of our team. Actually, the woman at the end of the picture, Tamara, uh, right now she's part of our team. But uh, she was, or maybe even is right now, Tallinn University student. And uh, she actually came in as a volunteer to help us out with the, some of the research studies and everything. So basically, she came in to do a little bit of research as of data and activity and some like uh, things which we can compare. But, but in the end, uh, she finished up doing marketing and all of that sort of things, content creating because we're a startup, so to speak, and uh, how to say, if you come in and we see potential in you, you're gonna be all hands on. So, uh, and also because right now, 
uh, we, we basically never had an office. We had an office one time for, let's say, three months, but then the money ran out <laughs> as, as the startup, uh, uh, startup goes. Uh, and uh, sometimes we try to do some team activities, go golfing and you know, try to really speak with each other and see how, how it's going, how are we doing. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the picture, but we had uh, two, uh, two Tartu University students from, uh, from Ghana, um, from Africa, uh, who were studying in Tartu IT. And they were our two first developers. Uh, we were paying uh, to them, of course. They were with us about uh, five or six months, if not mistaken. And uh, inside of that time, they actually both got their uh, EAPs as well. So they worked for us, and at the same time, they had their you know student points, so to speak. So that's all, always an option as well. But since the topic here is you know social entrepreneurship, and I, I've been talking about you know startup. Uh, Estonia is so popular because of the startups and unicorns, so to speak. But I think what our you know people are missing is not uh, not everyone is successful. And since we are always hearing that you know hearing that uh, all the time someone is gathering some amount of money or they just raise funds, then actually there are thousands of startups not not reaching anywhere, but only you know two or three a month are reaching the headlines. So yeah, it's not that, uh, how to say, uh, special. It's, it's quite hard for us as well. I think it's still hard because uh, our mission is not about, you know, just running around and catching money, but the mission that our CEO has always has is that we see that the usual people who are not sports people, who are not Olympics, uh, we have what's profitable uh, in, in, the side, in, the tech, in the technical side which we have. We have all, all those gadgets, but we're not using them to, to the best effort, which, which we could. And uh, he, he thought about it, you know, if we could actually put it in the behavior that, you know, let's say a company gives out some kind of prizes, if, if you just take care of yourself, you know, do a few thousand steps a day, it becomes a habit. And it's so special actually to hear uh, testimonials of uh, that there, there were like this husband and wife inside of a company, they started spend. Uh, they started uh, to spend more time outside with their kids, you know, playing. But at the same time, they got steps. They got points, and uh, everybody won. And but at the same time, we have truck drivers. You know, truck drivers are sitting all day long. And when you hear that some truck driver who, who was a little bit overweight, he he or she lost six seven kilos. I think those are the things that you know drive us. And why I think that uh, uh, you know. Having this mission-driven uh, sense of thought is uh, really important. Is because things at some point will get hard, and when they do, uh, the money or the paycheck won't save you. Because if you see that your numbers are going down, you don't, you're not attracted to any investor. It's quite hard to motivate yourself and your team. But but behind that is uh, some kind of mission. You know, that we're trying really to. Uh, bring revolution to this uh, fitness and health technology and everything related to that, then, you know, miracles can happen. And, and we have had some miracles, actually, you know, uh, which have saved us out and, uh, and got us funding and we were able to grow from, you know, 10 companies. We had, we had a long, long time before COVID. Yumo wasn't that popular. And when COVID came, we jumped from 10 companies to 100 companies in two months. And then, you know, we were so happy, not, not only happy, you know, that our up MRR grew, grew and so on, but we were happy that, you know, we could give something to people that they actually need. They were looking for that input and we were able to give that. So for us, uh, uh, it's, it's really important. Uh, if, if we take anyone to work, I think we always ask, what is something that puts your eye to shine? We don't want you to just come and fill in a spot and do something that we want you to do but maybe asking yourself what is the thing that you know push on fire because in startup it's really it's really uh, how to say hard hard working environment uh, at the beginning at least if you're not funded and, anything. and second of all uh, we we really recommend you to develop yourself to be able to ask critical questions and and solve those problems or at least uh, come out with a theoretical solution because in the startup world, you know, if you run into the wall, you, you, you have to jump over it or find another way. 
So waiting for the CEO to do that move for you is not always the option because there's too, too less of time, too less of resources. And I think overall, it's a really great skill to have on you. So thinking out loud, not being afraid, and you know, encourage, encouraging each other. So I think this is something uh, where I'm going to finish for now. I hope I said something about social entrepreneurship as well. So just to sum up, uh, we are really trying to uh, put people moving in our society to be companies that have the influence to give out some orders or give out some uh, you know, encouragement and actually change that. Uh, <laughs> um, I think you is a great example of what also um, social enterprise network in Estonia is trying to do is to encourage startups um, to think socially or, you know, the, actually the challenge is again sometimes different that we have a lot of startups that are working on social goals, but they don't uh, know that they should, you know, call themselves a social enterprise as such. Um, and because we have such a vast network of uh, these different e ecosystem for growing a startup is quite good in, in, in Estonia with accelerators, incubators, investor community, and so on, um, then it's, it's, it's only nice if this can be tapped into uh, but the, the ideas that are being then mentored also have a social uh, nuance in them. Um, any questions from, from the physical audience uh, to Klaus? Yes, please. Very interesting uh, speech, uh, but uh, it's very startup related. Yep. I just want to talk a little bit about your business model because I don't know if you are a for profit or not for profit organization, but it seems like yep. it was
uh, you know, brought out the most active school. There were some prizes. Everything was for, for free. It was on television and everything. Uh, and you know, there there was like this moment where we can see that okay, it might be can be, and it is a tool which helps people to be better or get better in in, in sense of that way. I don't know if I answered your question, but I think we can continue the discussion. Um... Later, it's a very relevant topic, uh, practically so it's nodding as well. Uh, but I'd like to give the chance, Robert, for us to take uh, a question from online as well, if there have been any. Yes, well, uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It's been really great to hear a lot about this, uh, this uh, very interesting startup, actually. That's, that might be actually relevant to <laughs> our institute as well. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I actually want to wonder, I was wondering, um, because there's no questions from the audience, but uh, there's a question from me. Um, like, do you have any particular skills at the moment that you are lacking or like missing in your team that you might like expect from uh, people that uh, are gonna write to you? Yeah, sure. So first things first, developers, no one has them. So I don't think uh, if you have development skills, you, I guess you already are in some place, but if you don't, then we're open. Second of all, uh, marketing, uh, we are lacking of marketing, of course. Uh, and content creators. So basically, social media is the thing today. We have to be everywhere and uh, at all the time. So I think those three things: develop, developers, marketing, and in a sense, content creating. And if somebody mm -hmm. is interested in what you do and thinks they might be a good fit, what should they do? Uh, if you think you're a good fit, or want to hear more, or ask, or uh, whatever the case might be, uh, yeah. So bad that I don't have any of my contacts here, but. Uh, our website has our contacts. You can just write to us. Uh, I can give you my email afterwards, or phone number, and, and we, we should talk more. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Klaus. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, I will uh, put your contact on the screen in yeah. a second. Uh, so you're welcome to, uh, to take your seat once thank more. Um, to wrap up today's uh, session, uh, Share my screen with the virtual audience for the last time. Right, so uh, this is um, all the websites of speakers today. Once again, it's a bit uh, maybe hazy, but uh, I hope you can see it. But this will circulate later with all the attendees. Um, if you register in advance, we have your email details and we will send you a recording. If not, please make sure that you have signed the registration sheet and you have put your contact details there so we could uh, reach out to you. Um, then, we have? Um, our project is still ongoing, so also two links about our website. I encourage you to join our Facebook group. So we have a special Facebook group um, called uh, Unlock Amif and this is for foreign students who have gone through the training programs or have attended our other events. So when we have more events coming, uh, you are welcome to, uh, I mean, this is where we will share information and you will get it faster than through the university mailing lists. Uh, you will get it firsthand that you know when the next event will be. And I can already say that we will have more events this fall. Um, the dates are not yet in place, but we will do um, some follow-ups and these will then have a different sectoral focus than social entrepreneurship. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I also mentioned that there will be training sessions and the next one is at September 10th already, uh, and you can still register to this. Uh, we will circulate the link in the Zoom chat for those who are online, but we will send it also to those who registered. Um, I mean, they have the email addresses, we'll send it to you there directly. So this is, this is the four hour, uh, three to four hour training of uh, the sort of basic knowledge on what to keep in mind when trying to find a job in Estonia or working in Estonia. Um, and as I mentioned, we have had three past events and they were all webinars and the recordings are available on YouTube. Um, so they're relatively recent. There you have different companies and nonprofits also sharing like we had today on, on who they're looking for at the moment, uh, what are the opportunities they're seeking for, um, plus also providing some advice on what they consider relevant, uh, like in a CV or in a motivation letter. Uh, so some good tips have been shared in these events as well. Um, so uh, I hope, Robert, you put all these links to the Zoom chat as well to, to those who are online. Uh, and the last thing here is that uh, we appreciate feedback. Uh, so uh, this is just a very short survey of five, five questions. Basically, you say whether you liked it and what recommendations you might have for us. 
because we are still conducting these events and any feedback is good for us, we can, we can take it into account. So those who are in the physical room we will later walk by and, and scan the QR and you get an easy access. Uh, and this we will also circulate uh, through the email. Uh, thank you all online who, who are with us today. Thank you for those who are being present. Uh, also, you know, happy school year. Uh, last year, yesterday was the 1st of September. Today is the 2nd of September. I, I wish you all the best in your studies. And of course, I hope uh, you also find good opportunities to either volunteer, intern, or work in Estonian social enterprises in the non-profit sector, or you know, you might end up uh, in, in the startup sector being uh, maybe a startup founder yourself, maybe a social enterprise startup founder <laughs> in one of uh, Katri Lise's incubator programs that she's also running. Um, so thanks again, and uh, it was great to have you here. <laughs>